Hello everybody online as well. My name's Ken Coles. I'm the executive director of Farming Smarter, maybe for not much longer because my chairman is listening to me harass the crowd. Thank you so much for coming. It is absolutely a gorgeous day for a tour. Really glad that you could make it and thank you to you folks online as well. One thing that I'd like to ask in my presentations, I don't like actually talking all that much. I'd like you guys to do a lot of the talking too. So let's Let's have as much dialogue as we can. This is a great time to share what you've seen in the growing season this year. Talk about uh, some of the differences that are, are happening this year. One of the big differences this year is that we actually have a crop. So that's pretty exciting, right? Three years of drought and it's, a, it's probably a good thing the, that we were as dry as we were or we would have seen some pretty serious flooding. Uh, that always amazes me how much the land can actually take up, but uh, in some places we're, we're at saturation. And then you can see a, just a tremendous amount of flooding with just a half an inch to an inch of rain. So I think, uh, I hope the moods are better this year. Uh, I, I think that there's been a really, you know, get, getting pretty down when you have three years of drought. So I'm, I'm excited for this year. We, um, these plots that I'm going to share with you were actually pretty dry last year as well. And we, I think maximum yield we got on these pulses was about 15 bushels an acre. So I'm hoping we can, we can break, break that. So how many of you guys think that we're actually, it's been cold this year? Does it feel like it's been cold? Hands up. Of course, if you're online, you're in a totally different neck of the woods, so it probably doesn't matter. And if you're sticking your hand up at the computer by yourself, there's probably something wrong. Just kidding. So I think it feels like it's been a cool year too. But the funny thing is, is I just looked up the weather station data with the uh, ACES weather, that's the Alberta Climactic Information System, the Alberta government. We're actually above normal on temperature and heat units. So I think um, reasonable to say that there has been some cool nighttime temperatures. Like I think we've seen it in the crops. They've been slow to grow, but we were actually quite warm in April. So April and May, was really quite warm and I think that's where some of that heat uh, unit accumulations come from. Yes, George? Soil temperature, you can check that because I think soil temperature is like the cooler than last year. And I think that's probably why we're seeing that slow growth. So George mentioned that the soil temperatures have been slow to warm and I'd say yes and no. They were actually really quick to warm in the springtime because again we had a much hotter April than normal. And, and I think things were off to a start. We've got some trials where we were actually seeding early April and then into May and later, and you can see that effect. But we were also really dry this spring too. So before the rain started coming here in Lethbridge, uh, things were not germinating all that well, mostly because that top bit was pretty dry. So we have all these different combination of environmental factors that sort of changes how things do. Last year, yes, John, sorry. The question was frost event, and of course I didn't look that one up. We didn't have a terrible spring for frost here. So I was nervous that we were going to because we did have a fair bit of stuff going in early. Uh, but I don't think um, it was actually a really bad year for frost. Does that sound about right to you guys? Okay. So precipitation, are we above normal, below normal? Above? What's normal for here? For here, 180 mils at this time, seven inches. We're a little bit above normal, not as much as you might think. So right here, we're 22% above normal on moisture. So at the demo farm, the irrigation demo farm is just a half a mile down the road. We've had 220 mils versus 180 for normal. Now my farm is four miles north of here and I have four more inches of rain. So there's a lot of different, um, results of rain depending on where you are but a little bit bigger and the big interesting part is that almost six inches of that rain came in two single rain events so back in may 19th we had two inches and then just recently june 28th we had about 3.2 inches here of moisture so really big dumps of rain and luckily, I think in a lot of cases, especially the dryland farmers, that soil background moisture was so low that we were able to actually really soak up a lot of it. So some beautiful looking crops, and I hope that, uh, that everybody is ex extremely profitable this year and, and can keep, keep things rolling. So the trial that I'm gonna talk about here 
is, is one that's pretty fun. We did a four year study looking at precision planters in canola. So there's been a lot of interest and talk in canola. The canola seed industry has been using more planters, but now we're getting people interested in planters all across the country. Um, we found that one thing that was a concern to me with the use of planters was the fact that the folks that were using them were using them for dry beans and sugar beets on a 22 inch row spacing. So for me going into canola and a lot of the work over the years has shown that going too wide of a row space on our sort of typical small grain crops is not a good thing. I think when we moved into zero tillage, we actually increased the width of our row spacing for a lot of reasons that there was a bit of a compromise there. So we went to nine, 10, 12 inch row spacing for zero tillage reasons. And what that did was allowed for a more cost effective planter and also to be able to move through that residue. But world record yields, if you've ever seen the folks talk about the world records, they're usually on much narrower row spacing. So seven inch row spacing, five inch row spacing. But I think the fact that we've improved our cropping systems into zero till much better soil, uh, duff layers that are reducing our evapotranspiration, that benefit definitely outweighed the row spacing piece. So when I'm looking at using planters, which are originally used more for corn and soybeans on 30 inch row spacings, uh, bringing them into our sort of world of small grains crops is a bit of a change. So we decided to test on a 12 inch row spacing with the planter and we basically crunched that up. Uh, it, it's pretty tight. It's hard to change the plates because everything is so close. But we thought, why, why not try that? Because there's a lot of great advantages to a planter. What do you guys think is the be best thing about planters? What are they really good at? So seed depth, depth control, absolutely. In fact, in what I've seen so far in studying with the planters, I think one of the biggest advantage to the planter is the depth control. And, and that's because it's got the seed, the depth control right exactly where the seed is coming out. On our air drills, where's the depth control? It's usually way at the back at the packer wheel and you're seeding up here. So you've got that gap difference that really doesn't allow awesome contouring. Of course, there's differences in different openers that are, some are better than others, but when you're talking about a small shallow seeded crop like canola, that depth control is pretty darn important. In fact, this year, because it was so dry, we saw a lot of split emergence. Did you guys see that in canola where you're having a little bit of issues with getting a nice even stand? So the, the keeners, which is usually the right thing to do in agriculture, is to get out there and seed as early as you can. It was dry and you had poor emergence. George had mentioned over at that plot, why does this canola look so bad? It's because we seeded mid-April. And not only did we have issues where, in that case, I think the moisture level was just, right, just barely there. So some of the seeds made it to the moisture and some of it didn't. So then when the rain came, we had a second flush of canola coming and then you have an uneven crop. So I think getting an even crop is always a really, really important agronomic uh, goal that we should have. And that's a tough thing with, with a shallow seeded crop. We don't want to be burying it too far. But in that case, I'm guessing, you know, the early seeded crops aren't looking as good as waiting a little bit later this year. Have you guys seen that, generally speaking? What's the earliest canola you guys seeded? Nobody seeded any crops or consulted on that. So that's, that's pretty late in all honesty, right? Yeah. So I'm guessing it looks pretty decent, reasonable. Later seeded look better? Yeah. So that's, that's what we've been seeing as well. The other thing is, is there is something about Southern Alberta that's normal, which we seem to have a lot of as well. Wind. So I've heard that a number of fields actually had to be reseeded because of wind shear, especially the folks that don't have good stubble cover or the irrigated crops. Um, there were canola fields that were literally cut right off because of the wind and the saltation effect of that erosion. So another good advantage of a planter is the singulation. So what it does is it meters out with a vacuum plate and puts one plant, one seed exactly the same distance one after the other. And as we go through here, you'll be able to pick out the differences. But between those two things, um, I think that there is a potential advantage for planters in a broader scale. So when folks are buying a planter for canola, the first thing they're thinking is, that's a lot of money. Can I seed other crops with it? So after our, our experience with the canola study, we started thinking, well, let's give it a try. 
So we went to Dwayne Kirchner. Uh, we're using a monosem planter and said, okay, we got to figure out the plates that we need for all these different types of crops and see what we can do. Funny enough, we only ended up using two plates for all of the corn or all of the pulses that we seeded here. So it wasn't that big of a change. When we started messing around with um, smaller seeded things like wheat and hemp, that required a different plate. And Scott, where's Scott? Scott kind of scared me this year. We did one trial last year and I'm not gonna lie, like I loved looking at the precision pulses. They just looked amazing. In fact, when we looked at our percent immersion compared to the air drill, in a lot of cases, we were 30% better with the planter as far as emergence is concerned. So we had these beautiful looking crops to start and then it never rained all year. That's why we ended up with 10 and 15 bushel crops. So the long and the short of it is on our three trials last year, incredible improvement on emergence but really no yield effect. So that's kind of a, a downer, but we did have a really low, um, I guess, yield environment. This year, we actually have a big environment. Uh, Scott presented last week at a trial. He said he thought they looked pretty too and had a client that also decided to plant some peas on a 15 inch row spacing. And I, that kind of makes me nervous because we're just sort of trying some crazy stuff out first before we would recommend anyone doing it. Uh, I sure hope it works out still, but the pictures that he showed, it's a pretty nice looking crop. I love the fact that we're gonna have a year where we actually have some yield potential, and I'm guessing we might pick out some differences. One thing that I noticed, this trial, we decided to go seeding rates at a kind of a normal seeding rate, and then a half seeding rate. We learned in the canola stuff, we can probably get away with a lower seeding rate because we're getting that increased in, improvement in emergence, but for the most part, we're not recommending that you cut seeding rates. And this year in particular, what, for whatever reason, our normal seeding rates definitely look better than our low seeding rates. And remember, our low is literally half of that rate. And that was one of the issues that Scott got into on a 15 inch row spacing was how do you get that seed population high enough with a planter that matches what we're used to doing. And I'm thinking that we don't need to be planting at the same levels that we're used to doing. So I think you guys were about a three quarter rate Three quarter rate looks just fine. And um, in our instances, I think that we'll be able to probably enter is that it's totally different from an air seeder. So the skills that you need to properly set an air drill, um, i sorry, to properly set a planter is, is, it's up there. It's a learning curve. And in fact, there are often people in the corn belt still putting on planting schools. And so leveling the drill is really important. For, for first of all, and I think we actually messed up some of our plots. You saw those corn plots over there. Because we offset openers, if you don't have it leveled absolutely perfect, then now you're changing depth at two of my rows versus the two that are closer to the drill. So those, as far as being able to get a proper singulation on the plates, lentils have a really weird shape. And to be able to get that so they're not sucking two seeds on versus one and to be able to separate that properly really takes take a lot of fine tuning and so did wheat wheat is really tricky but the the nice big seeds like corn faba beans peas they were really easy to just get set perfectly and then that we have that proper singulation so that is a i'm glad you asked that question so what kind of size of tanks do they have behind them and, and that's a good question. Uh, the question was, what size of tanks do we have on these drills? So that is an issue in being able to get planters mainstream in our agriculture. Now, I know some folks have just paired up a John Deere tank with their, with their planter. So there's some of that going on. Uh, I usually mention John Deere did buy Monosem and they are in the midst of coming out with a field scale model targeting Western Canadian grain crops. So they'll have a tank set up for that. But that is a, a generally an issue. Um, a lot of times, the other side of it is, is being able to put your fertilizer down. So in our, our case, we did get a granular kit with a, with a side banding disc opener, as well as a liquid kit to put the phosphorus down. So those are some of the issues I think with planters is that we're not there yet in all honesty. There's still a lot of adaptation that needs to be made. Um, and, and I think that's something we're probably going to see in the next few years. I'd be keeping an eye out for that coming because right now there's a bit of a compromise. So if you, don't, if you want to do a one pass seating system, uh, it's not as common, but it is possible. Did they? 
Cool. So the comment was for the online folks at Borgo just recently released a drill that has sort of planter technology. So I'd be on the on the lookout for for some hitting the market soon. Okay, we're gonna move down to the next crop. So as game is concerned, this one's really tricky and. I'm going to admit, and I don't know if it's the soil type that we have here, we struggle growing good soybean crops. Cool and, sorry? Cool so, George is saying cool nights has been rough. On I believe that. I also think there's something to do with our soil type because I have seen better crops in other places. I'm not sure if it's the clay content or what, but um, you know, these will still pull through okay, but they're definitely not looking as good as I think they should. So. Number one, two, three, or four. You probably need to walk back and forth to be able to see. There's a few bigger plants popping out in the floor that my eye is attracted to. They are pretty nice and even. Number one again. Just hard to tell, right? They're all the same? How long is our growing season? Sorry? How long is the growing season? Because then I might take this one because it looks like the most, most, it's the most it's even. even. It's the most even, even crop. Yeah. But it's behind that. So. Okay, so this is the plant half rate. And this is the planter at the high rate. It seems like the most even one, yeah. yeah. This is a little higher population, but it's not as even. Yeah, the growth staging is not, not as even. But I think the air drill ones don't look too bad either. Yeah, I don't really have a lot to say about this one. This one's kind of confusing me. But chickpeas, chickpeas is a little more. Yeah. This was about May 10th. Yeah. Wow. And th this is very consistent with what Okay. I'm almost done. Do you guys pick number one? <laughs> so chickpeas definitely a, a winner on the on the planter again and again because of this year looking forward to seeing the the yield differences it just gives you that crop but like andre mentioned too askakaita is such a female dog on on chickpeas that you have to end up spraying it multiple times just to keep it under control so in, in a lot of cases, do you want that thick canopy cover? I'm not always so sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, and it is going to. So the question or comment was more on a trade-off between row spacing, canopy closure, uh, and likelihood of having to spray anyways. And I think that's a good point. I'd always rather have a good, strong, healthy crop that's closed over because I, you know, I, I just think that weed competition, all those other factors are going to, to play. But what really matters is the type of year that you end up having. For, for our case, a lot of times chickpeas is a dry land crop, um, really moisture limited. So you got to do your best with it to get whatever little yield potential there is out there. So that is actually all I had to show you. Kind of had a simple, a simple plot on this one. It, it's not uh, it's not groundbreaking, but it is sort of a first test at can we seed anything else with a planter and be successful. Again, these are on 12 inch row spacings. I probably I probably should consider doing a 15 inch because I think that's where the market is with the planters as far as row spacing. So there's a good chance we may look at it. I also saw some of the other trials where we were looking at using strip. So 
strip tillage and say putting down some of your mobile nutrients or maybe even your nitrogen ahead of time in the fall might be a nice fit for these planters as well especially since we're still dealing with that issue that they don't all have the ability to do one pass seeding operation so we've got our little plot size strip tiller machine that actually looks pretty decent on a 15 inch row which is something that's really never been done before like in corn narrow rows was 30 inches at one point they used to be even wider so we're finding that that the row spacing piece is still an important factor in agriculture our plant population is still a factor, timing. And the truth is, is there's, there's no really great answers for everything in agriculture. But the more we understand the concepts and principles, we may be what we're doing given on the conditions that we have each year. So if there's any further questions, I can take them. I'm not sure if there's any online questions. You guys are either not active or my team isn't telling me that you're giving me questions. They're so far away now, so I'm going to have to assume that there's no questions. I think that's a thumbs up. So thank you very much for your time, and I wish you the best of luck this year. And that there's no. Yeah.